One of the things we have to deal with in the aquarium hobby is fish diseases. It's unfortunate, but just like with any other living thing, it happens. Our hope with this video is to help you identify some of these fish diseases, how to treat them, and how to prevent them from happening in the first place. Unfortunately, we're not gonna have video footage of every single fish disease on this list. Who keeps that kind of footage laying around? But hopefully, we're gonna be able to explain them in enough detail so that you understand what these diseases are, you know what you're looking at. If you like this kind of content and you wanna see more videos like this, we do a new one every single week. You're gonna to wanna to make sure you subscribe to the channel, click that bell, so you can come and join us next week where we'll have 10 more things to talk about. So with all that said, here are the 10 most common fish keeping diseases. Ick is by far the most common fish keeping disease in the entire aquarium hobby. And there's no doubt that every fish keeper has dealt with this at one point or another. Ick is present in the environment in almost all aquariums. A lot of people want to argue that, but the fact is if your fish is strong and healthy, it's built up an immunity to this parasite. But if they're under immense stress, that's when their immune system can drop and they can become vulnerable to it. Stress can be caused by many different things in an aquarium, but some of the most common causes of stress in your fish are gonna be things like poor water quality, aggression with other fish, and even shipping fish. It's very common for a fish to come down with ick right when you get that fish in your tank. And you're like, what? The fish store sold me a sick fish. Well, you have to understand what that fish has gone through. That fish was raised in a farm with thousands of other fish. It was then bagged up and shipped to a distributor where it was still housed with thousands of fish competing for food. Then it was shipped again to a fish store where it was sitting there in the fish store with all the little kids walking up going <laughs> Then they get bagged up at the fish store and shipped again to your house where they're put into yet another brand new environment. It's a lot for them to go through. Symptoms of ick are gonna be small little white spots throughout the fish. They can be pretty much anywhere. They look like a little grain of sand or salt on your fish. These are very irritating little spots on the fish, so it's not uncommon to see the fish scratching up against decorations or even flashing on the bottom of the aquarium, rubbing themselves up against your substrate. The fish is also gonna seem a little lethargic, a little off, and they're probably also gonna be breathing heavy. The fact is you watch your fish every day, you know how they behave, and when they're behaving a little off, it's gonna be pretty obvious. Treating ick isn't as difficult as it may seem. Don't be intimidated by it. The very first thing that I always recommend to people is get that temperature up in your aquarium, raise it up to 82, 84, but make sure that's gonna be okay for your fish. Some fish are cool water fish. They're not gonna to tolerate something like that. Higher temperatures like 78 to 80 or even a little bit higher are gonna drastically impact the life cycle of ick, making it go away a lot faster. There's also some common products out there that are available almost everywhere, like Aquarium Salt, Ick X, or even Super Ick Cure from API. You can find these literally at Walmart. Ick is also very much contagious. So if you find that one of your fish has come down with Ick, you might as well assume every other fish in your aquarium has it. Don't take them out and put them in a hospital tank. Go ahead and treat your entire tank. Dropsy is mainly caused by poor water conditions and improper diet. This usually affects herbivores who've been given more of a protein diet versus having enough greens in their diet. You'll know your fish has dropsy if they look bloated and start acting lethargic. They'll also lose a lot of their color and they won't be in the mood to eat anything. I mean, if you're constipated, do you want to keep filling your mouth with stuff? Mm. This disease will cause fluids to build up internally and cause the fish to bloat so much that in severe cases, you'll actually see the fish's scales start sticking out. It's horrifying. Dropsy is a bacterial infection, so if it's caught early, you can up the temperature, add a little bit of Epsom salt, and in most cases, 
you can get things moving along. But if it's really bad and your fish is showing severe symptoms, you may want to add an antibiotic, something like a urethromycin. And still, you want to up your temperature to about 82 degrees. Another thing is clean water. I can't stress enough how important it is to keep your water clean. Okay, so just think about it this way. If you're in the hospital and you're being treated for something and you have an infection, you're always going to have everything around you clean. They're very cautious about how they keep things sterile. Your oxygen, clean air, your IV, when you get medication, everything's clean. Clean water has the same effect on fish as oxygen does for us. We don't want to breathe in funky old air. We don't want to breathe in air that has pollution in it. So your fish, they also need clean water. They need that so that they can get healthy and they can get rid of whatever the infection is that they have or disease. So just remember how important clean water is for your fish. Popeye is a bacterial infection where fluid will actually build up behind the fish's eye, causing it to bulge out and almost look like it's gonna fall out. This is usually caused by some type of injury to the eye area, which could be caused by aggression from another fish, or maybe your fish got startled and banged itself into one of your decorations, or it could even be negligent handling by the fish keeper. Think about it, a fish's eyeball is exposed all the time. It's not like they can close their eye at the sight of danger. So keep that in mind when you're chasing them around with a net in the aquarium. Just be careful. The first thing that we would recommend for treatment of Popeye is gonna to be to isolate that fish. We wanna give the fish as stress-free of an environment as possible. This is where a hospital tank's gonna come in handy. Plus, this isn't something that's contagious and would affect the other fish in your aquarium, so there's no need to expose fish to medications if they don't need it. This isn't the easiest thing to treat, but you're gonna have your best chances of success by isolating that fish, like I said earlier, making sure the water is nice and clean all the time in your hospital tank, and treat the tank with Epsom salt to help with the swelling. If the swelling is really severe and the Epsom salt isn't helping with that, you can turn to an antibiotic to help the fish internally. This is definitely not something that can be treated really fast. It's gonna require some time and a little bit of patience and maybe a little bit of luck. Like many of the diseases on this list, fin rot is caused by poor water conditions, stress, or aggression from other fish. The fish's fins get damaged, allowing bacteria in, which cause an infection. And this will start making the fins rot, kind of like just start fading away. Identifying that this is going on isn't too difficult. It'll start out with the fish's fins looking kind of ripped up and frayed. and will progressively get worse and if not treated, it can get so bad that the fins completely rot away, leaving only a stump. If you believe your fish has fin rot, it's best to isolate this fish, keeping it from other fish, give it good clean water, and treat it with antibiotics like urethromycin. There's also medications on the market that are specifically made for fin rot, but because I've never used it myself, I don't want to tell you that it's the best solution. But if you've used any of these medications and you have a good or bad experience with them, go ahead and put it in the comment below so we know how they work for you. Hole in the head is a disease that is commonly associated with Oscars, but it's not something that only Oscars get. It's a parasitic disease that can affect freshwater and saltwater fish, and if caught early, it can be treated pretty effectively. This is another parasite that can usually be fought off by your fish's immune system, but if they're under a lot of stress or if the water conditions are really bad, their immune system's gonna drop and they can become vulnerable to it. Hole in the head is one of the easiest diseases to diagnose because it is exactly what the name implies. It starts off as craters, big, 
divots in the fish's head, in the head area of the fish, but if not treated immediately, if you don't catch it early, those craters can actually spread throughout the fish's entire body. Once you see these pits or craters or holes start to develop, you need to react right away because that is when this is gonna spread. So you can't waste any time. You, you need to get on it as soon as you see it. This is the first disease that we're gonna recommend something that's actually pretty harsh, a pretty harsh medication, and that is metronidazole. That's what I call it anyway. I don't know exactly how you say it, but let's just call it metro to make things easier. This is another disease that we're gonna to wanna to isolate the fish in a hospital tank for. Give them good, clean water and a stress-free environment because stress is what caused this to begin with. I've also heard of people having success using general cure for a hole in the head. I would guess though that they caught it really, really early because general cure is a great product, but it's not quite as powerful as just a straight up metronidazole. My advice would be if you've got a cichlid with huge holes and divots in their head, skip General Cure. General Cure is a great product, but let's go right past that and go to metronidazole because if it's really big, then it's probably too late. So let's go with the harsh stuff first, skip the beginner stages. Let's, let's just go all in. Gill flukes are a parasite and they're like a teeny tiny worm that you can't even see with the naked eye. I mean, they're like, mm, so tiny. This is frustrating because your fish could have flukes, but they don't show any real signs like lesions or sores on their body. You'll just see them acting lethargic and slow. And you might see a little bit of redness, but it's kind of hard to see on certain fish, especially goldfish. If your fish are acting a little off and you've had a couple deaths in the tank, it's possible you could have gill flukes going on. If you suspect that your fish has gill flukes, there's a couple things that you can do to get rid of them. First thing is this, just like anything else, you need to do water changes. Next, if you've called it early, you'll need to medicate with general cure from API. But if this has been going on for a little while, you'll want to go with something more powerful. Prozequano is the best medication for flukes, but it can be tricky to find on its own. Luckily, there are products that contain it like Hikari's Prozipro. If your fish is having swim bladder issues, it's one of the saddest things to see. It's comparable to a bird not being able to fly. It's, it's just terrible. Anyway, what is swim bladder? Think of it like a life jacket for your fish. This is an organ that is full of gases and it's those gases that allow your fish to swim around and not just sink to the bottom of the tank. Have you ever watched a stingray swim? They kind of flap their wings and they fly, but what happens if they stop? They sink right down to the bottom. Why is that? It's because a stingray doesn't have a swim bladder. It's how they're able to just kind of sit there on the bottom of the tank and just look around. I love it. So it's basically like a balloon in your fish's belly that allows them to stay upright and stay swimming. If something goes wrong with that balloon, they might start to swim a little crooked or maybe be upright swimming instead of leveled off like they normally are. Several things can cause swim bladder issues like eating too much, a female holding eggs, or believe it or not, even gulping in too much air. This is why swim bladder issues are pretty prevalent in betas. I know it sounds mean, but if your fish is struggling to swim around or they're just kind of all over the place like they're drunk, it is absolutely time to react. Start feeding your fish sparingly so that you're not packing more in there and adding to the problem. Keep their water super clean and raise the temperature in your tank four to five degrees from where you normally keep it. We want whatever is internally out of whack in the fish to work its way out. And one of the ways that people do this is by feeding them peeled peas. This isn't something that I've actually done, but I have heard from many people that it works. And here's the bottom line. If you have a precious fish that's having swim bladder issues, it's pretty much worth trying anything to cure it. Velvet can present itself similar to ick, but it's very different. And in my opinion, it's much more deadly. Most of the time when you have ick, you can do some minor things and get rid of it fairly quickly. But with velvet, 
There's a lot more to it and it can wipe your tank out before you even know you have it. Remember when John said it looks like salt or sand? Well, velvet is similar, but on a much finer scale. It's more of a metallic dust, and that's why you'll hear people call it gold dust disease. Just like it, you'll see the fish moving slower, breathing heavier, and scratching itself on a decoration or the substrate. Treating velvet requires more powerful medications than it, but the good thing is there's plenty of them out there to choose from. These are copper-based meds, so you've got to be careful because these meds aren't safe for all fish and they're lethal to invertebrates. Another way to treat velvet would be to up your temperature to about 82 degrees. You can add some aquarium salt and go ahead and turn those lights off and give your fish a little bit of a stress-free environment. The temperature, the salt, the lack of lighting will drastically reduce the life cycle of the parasite but it'll take much longer than if you go ahead and just use medication. Cloudy eye is pretty self-explanatory. It's a haze that develops on your fish's eye and it can progressively get worse to a point where they can actually lose their vision or possibly even lose the eye completely. The answer to what causes cloudy eye is very simple. It's you not doing your job. Cloudy eye in most cases is caused by poor water conditions, high stress, or malnutrition. So like I said, if you were doing your job, this wouldn't even happen. If it does happen though, you're gonna wanna increase your water changes and treat with a product like Melifix. But if I'm being honest, we haven't had all that much success curing cloudy eye, unless it's caught really early. Wait, did I just admit to us being guilty of not doing our job as fish keepers and it resulted in our fish getting cloudy eye? Well, yeah, do as I say, not as I do. Columnaris is a nasty one. There's a lot to talk about and I'm just gonna read the symptoms off to you. If your fish has columnaris, they'll have ragged fins, ulcers on the skin, white or cloudy fungus-like patches, ew, mucus on gills, head and dorsal fin area, a color change in their gills, rapid breathing and loss of appetite. I told you it was nasty. Columnaris is caused by basically all of the common mistakes that we all make. Stress, overcrowding, improper diet, poor water conditions. This is a bacteria that is highly contagious that enters the fish through their mouth, gills, or an open wound. If you run into this, you need to treat with antibiotics. There's no need to isolate a single fish. You need to go ahead and just treat the entire tank because this disease is highly contagious. Treat the whole tank and don't cross contaminate between other tanks. Be careful with your nets and your hands when you go tank to tank. So there you go, those are the 10 most common fish keeping diseases, how to treat them, how to prevent them. I hope that this has been able to help you out a little bit to get through whatever diseases you might be dealing with. Hopefully you're not, hopefully you're doing your job and you won't have to deal with any of these. Trust me, we're doing our job. Hopefully you're doing yours too. But anyway, thank you so much for watching this. We put out a new episode of 10 Things every single week. So if you like this and you wanna see more, click that subscribe button, click the notification bell. While you're at it, click like, why not? It doesn't cost you anything, right? So anyway, once again, thank you for watching. I look forward to seeing you again next week with 10 more things. <laughs>